Please take your hymn book and sing page number 27. Page 27, while the choir is dismissed, we're going to ask you to stand if you can, please. Page 27, I sing the mighty power of God. And you are invited to sing with a smile. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to Full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word, and then pronounced them God. Lord, how thy wonders are. Display where'er I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky, there's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glories known, and clouds arise and tempests blow. By order from thy throne, while all that borrows life from thee is ever to thy care, and everywhere that man can be, thou God art present there. Thank you, you may be seated, and we'll sing. Page 37, How Great Thou Art. <clears throat> Sing all four verses, 37. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, where I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou Sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then 
sings my soul, my Savior God to be. How great thou art, how great thou art. Sing out the last verse, please. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Thank you for your singing. Pastor Larson will now come and present the scripture reading. Go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Psalm 29. And I'll ask that you'll stand for the reading of your God's word if you're physically able to, out of respect for the Lord of God. And I'll ask you to join me aloud on the verses 2 and 10. The Bible reads in Psalm 29, a psalm of David. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He, breaketh, he maketh also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like young unicorns. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to cleave and discovereth the forest. In his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Thank you. You may be seated. I was lost in my sin. With no hope or peace within, lost in darkest night, stumbling on down my way with a debt I could not pay. With no hope inside. to you in tender love, waiting patiently. Won't you give the Lord all your cares, leave behind your past despairs, he will set you free. 
about you, but since I met Jesus, my life changed, never to be the same, and I am so thankful for that. And we may not be victorious in the eyes of this world, but we are victorious throughout eternity. Our God is so good, and he's good all the time. I just love those old hymns. I love the specials that we have people sing. It encourages me, and I hope you've been encouraged today as well. But I have you open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. I'm just going to read two verses there. They will be going through a number of verses as well as the New Testament. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, there's children's services. Please uh, dismiss for that. I don't know that I'll ever get that needs to go up on the screen or something. I don't know. I'll blame somebody, I'm sure. It's so wonderful to have kids running around. But while they're uh, dismissing, uh, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 and 13 is what I'll be reading. And have your Bibles uh, handy as well, and maybe a pen and paper, because I'm not going to take the time to be able to read all the scriptures uh, that we'll be going through today. But Deuteronomy chapter 10 Verse 12 and 13, it says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God? And that's the point I want to make here this morning. God requires us to fear him, to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good, for you, for me. Let's pray, most gracious Heavenly Father, God, again, we are just so thankful for today and what you've allowed us to have here. But Father, as uh, Pastor Jason had mentioned, uh, this day is your day. And we not only will rejoice and be glad in it, but this is a day we worship you. We revere you. We lift your name up by song and now by word. And Father, pray that you are pleased with us and you'll be glorified by all that's said and done. Give me those words to speak that only you can use. Speak to the hearts of your people. We thank you and love you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our text, we see that God is specifically speaking to Israel, but in principle, And actually, we'll see in the New Testament, by command, he's speaking to all of us today, us Christians, you and I here. Now, you'll notice that I spend a lot of time talking about Christians and our responsibilities and our effectiveness and many things about us. Well, there are some things that God requires of us. As Christians, there is great responsibility. There is a requirement that God has levied upon us, and we see it clearly in the Old Testament, and we'll read a little bit of it in the New Testament. But what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? He required Israel, but he requires us as well to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him. Do you love Jesus today? Do you love our God? Well, then we know that we should at least keep his commandments. But we need to fear him, though he loves us. I loved my dad, but I feared my dad. It's the same with our God. We need to love him. We need to fear him. 
We need to walk in all his ways. Fear God. It is a command, not just a recommendation. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. 1 Peter 2, 17. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Now this one I really want to pick out. Love the brotherhood. Love one another. Love the born-again believers outside of this church. Churches of like faith. Love them. We can, you know. We have the Holy Spirit of God, but sometimes we don't love them because we're kind of in the flesh. I don't have to like somebody to love them. Ask my wife. Sometimes she says things I don't like, but I love her more than I love almost anybody except Jesus. And I'm sure she could say the same about me. So it's, it, it's fair play. It goes both ways. But we need to love one another. But it continues on and it says what? Fear God. That's a command in the New Testament, not just in the Old Testament. Honor our king. Honor him. Do we honor him in what we say, what we do, where we go, the thoughts in our minds, how we deal with the brotherhood? We're commanded to fear God. And we need to fear him to claim his promise in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I'm not going to preach on this verse. I'm going to read through it, but you'll see where I'm going here. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises. Now he's speaking about in chapter 6 there that we receive Christ and become the children of God. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, don't you like the way God thinks about us? Dearly beloved, that's more than just a friend or a casual relationship. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In the fear of God, we can claim his promises and, and it helps us cleanse ourselves of that filthiness and uh, of the flesh and the spirit and perfecting holiness as we fear him. We as well are to submit to one another in the fear of God. And that means to yield to one another. In Ephesians 5.21, Ephesians 5.21 Submitting yourselves one to another, yielding yourself. What does that take to do that? It takes a little humility to yield to others. Well, I know as much or more than they know. I can do that better. I had a pastor uh, once, he said, well, I don't use anybody's uh, programs and things because if whatever they can do, I can do better. I'm going, the bad thing is, or the good thing, he could. He just very talented, very gifted. Uh, but we need to humble ourselves to yield to one another. It's hard. And, uh, but we're commanded to do that. And so we are to yield, to submit to one another. And we do that in the fear of God. We can serve God acceptably as we fear him. In Hebrews 12, 28. Hebrews 12, 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. I'm so thankful for that. The kingdoms on earth, they come and they go. But the kingdom that we'll be inheriting is forever and will not be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We need to fear our God. Now, that's not talking about being terrorized by him, though we should. I mean, I know I use this term. It's probably not very the nicest thing to say, but God could squish us like a bug. If he wanted to, he's God. 
He created us. He'll use us or not. He can do with us as He pleases. We sure don't like the thought of that. Well, God needs me. I don't know that I'd use those words. He doesn't need us, but He chooses to use us because He loves us. And He wants to have that relationship with us. And we need to revere Him and have that godly fear. We should be afraid of Him as I was afraid of my father uh, when I see the old belt coming out when it was time for some uh, discipline. Uh, I was afraid of that. But I knew He loved me and I, I wanted to be like my dad. Not in everything, but in many things. And so I feared him in the way the Bible talks about it in these verses that we'll be speaking about. It's about revering him, honoring him, respecting him. It's not about being afraid to be with him. He loves us. But because of that, we have much that we can do and are to do. It tells us that we are to walk in the fear of the Lord continually live not just in terror of God but in reverence and respect why are you here today are you here to make yourself feel good are you here to check off the little block well I did my spiritual thing today I gave I gave God my hour yeah I, I, I sang into my hymn book so no one can hear me I say it before and I'm going to say it again when you sing and if if anybody complains, it's because they're not singing. Because if you're singing, you don't hear anybody else. Sing to him. He wants to hear from you. We're lifting him up. We need to revere him and respect him. We worry too much about what the world thinks or other people think about us. Yet we should fear the one who can kill and cast us into hell, it tells us in the book of Matthew. And therefore, this leads me to the question, does God have any requirements for us as Christians? If he does, what are they? In the words of an acronym, SOP, how many know what SOP stands for? Standard Operating Procedures. Sometimes they say, oh no, seat of pants. I mean, it means different things to me and different people. But for us, it's standard operating procedures. So we have here. This is the standard, and we are to operate by these procedures. Not by what the world says, not by what we think in our own minds. SOP. It's really pretty simple. The Air Force gave me all kinds of, we had a bookcase filled with manuals. And we had to know all those manuals, and you had to do exactly by it. Standard operating procedure. And if you deviated from that when you had an inspection, they wrote you up and it could cause some serious problems. Well, when we don't respect these and stick by this, we can have some serious problems. The auditor is coming. The inspector's coming. We will be judged by his word, not by our thoughts. And so we need to... Uh, Meet regularly and consistently with him through his words. He is, or the word is our standard operating procedure for his people. And it's to be done in devotion and obedience and service. And Pastor Jason was talking about service here today, helping us with our facilities, helping us in our ministries, getting involved. We are the body of Christ, and a body that's not functioning fully is of little use. We need to get after it. We need to be busy. God has something for you to use, and he has gifted you with at least one spiritual gift, and he's given you many abilities, so why not use them for him? Not just for making a wage, not just for our own benefits, but for those of others. And that being said... We're going to talk about some of God's requirements for us as in our text verse. And simply, first, that we fear Him. That we fear the Lord, and this means to honor and reverence Him. I think of in Luke chapter 20, in Luke chapter 20, and I'm only going to read a few verses there to really kind of uh, bring you up to where what we're talking about here. But in, in Luke chapter 20, verse 9, 
It says, then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. Sounds familiar. We see this similar theme with uh, the, the parable of the talents and the parable of the pounds. Uh, a husbandman or a certain man or a nobleman going into a far country. Uh, but then in verse 13, Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him. And when they see him, when they see him speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 16, He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. There will be a judgment to those uh, that won't reverence him, that won't believe on him, that won't do what God would ask them to do. They didn't fear God. That's the problem of our nation today and the world today. They just have no fear of God. If they really understood what they were up against, they would fear God. Now they will, but it, I'm afraid it'll be too late. And the sad part is, there are Christians today that don't fear God. Not only do they not reverence Him, I've, I've seen on videos some of the services, church, if you can call them church services or concerts, that people go to and want to call it worship. They're worshiping idols. They're worshiping themselves. Standing on the seats and having to wear... When they issue you earplugs at the door, turn around and go out. Amen. There's no fear of God. The one that died for them loves them more than anybody can love us and will not fear him. It's a sad state of affairs, but that's why we are where we are today. And we as believers, as Christians, should reverence the Son because we know he is the image and the representative of God. If someone thinks they know God and don't reverence the Son, they're sadly mistaken. And the Bible is very clear. I appreciate Brother Alec, as he uses these verses, as he uh, went door knocking the other day, and I asked him to share uh, kind of how he does things. I hope you're not embarrassed, Brother Alec, for me bringing attention to you. But at the same time, oh well. <laughs> but in 1 John chapter 2, and verse 23, it's important for people to understand that. In 1 John... And I'll get there. Chapter 2 and verse 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Jesus said um, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, what? But by him. You don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You may think you're a Christian because I have people say, well, I believe in God. Well, if you don't believe on Jesus Christ, you don't know God. You don't have a place in him and a part of him. John chapter 5 verse 23 says that same thing. They don't fear God. When we fear him, Scripture tells us many things, many things that will help us, many things that will encourage us, many things that warn us. But we see in Psalm 111 verse 10, it tells us that it's the beginning of, and maybe you can tell me what this is, wisdom. Now, I appreciate Miss Patty today. She was trying to be very kind to me when I don't deserve it and talking about the wisdom uh, that I will eventually have when, when, I'm, when I'm with Jesus. But it is the beginning of wisdom to fear God. Not man's wisdom, but God's wisdom. To fear God is the beginning, the sustaining and the furthering of wisdom which comes from God as we ask him for it. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. 
God will give you the wisdom, but we need to ask him. Or we'll continue on in our own wisdom, and that way we'll continue on in our own ways. To all men liberally, and upbraideth, or chide, or revile not, and it shall be given him. It's not talking about the wisdom to tear apart a, an engine on a car and put it back together, though that's helpful in the things of the world, but wisdom that will have eternal value, that will benefit us and others spiritually. We know as well that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. And it tells us as well that the fools, the lost, despise it. They don't care about the knowledge of God. They don't want to know him. I didn't want to know him before I got saved. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he understand them, because they're spiritually discerned. And a dead man who dead and trespasses in sin, and that's all of us before we receive Christ, what does a dead man do? Nothing. And they don't want to know. There's no place for God in their life. There was no place for God in my life except when I needed somebody to blame. They're fools. But for us, it's the beginning of knowledge, the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the knowledge of who God is and the relationship that he would have for us with him, the knowledge of absolute unchanging truth of God. Man's knowledge changes. That's why they got to keep revising all the books. They tell you, believe in science. And then next year they give us a new book because of stuff they said you couldn't trust. And then they say, trust me. This book hasn't changed. Now, men have tried to change it. Be careful of that. But the word of God does not change. It's because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is an unchanging God. We can trust in him and he will give us the knowledge when we fear him because we'll have a desire for it. And if you're a Christian today and you really don't desire the word of God, ask yourself why. I'm not saying you're lost, but is your relationship all that it should be? How can I expect to have a right relationship with my wife if I never tried to know her, understand her? Now, that's why a lot of us guys get in a lot of trouble. We don't really try and know our wives the way we should. And we eventually find out how wrong we were. And things get better when we straighten out. Well, God wants us to know him. He knows us intimately. And he wants us to know him intimately. But if you don't fear him, if you don't respect him, you don't want to know him, there's a problem. And I'm afraid there are many like that today. The fools who do not believe in him, but even sometimes we Christians. It tells us in 2 Peter 3.18 that we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Sunday school. I'm too old for Sunday school. Call it something else. But come and learn something. Go to the Bible Institute. Come to the morning service. Come to the evening service where you can and, and the Wednesday evening service and, and the special services. The people that recognize that they don't know everything just because they've been saved for a long time, come to these things. We need to know. We need to grow. God has commanded that of us. We must beware, though, of not becoming puffed up as we gain that knowledge. I've been some, and, I, and it, it irritates me when I've had visitors come in the front door over the years, and, and almost as soon as they say hello, it's, well, you know, I did this and that in the church, and I know this, and I've, I've got all these schools I've been to, and I've done all this, and I've done all that, and right away I go, hmm, trouble. This guy's all puffed up about who he thinks he is. He's going to cause me all kinds of problems. And who knows what he's going to do to the church. It's usually those guys who go, you know, are you sure that there's, you know, there's a great church down the road. They need your knowledge. 
we can get puffed up about ourselves. Education is good. Study the word of God. Know it. But understand that we don't understand it. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit, to bring all things to remembrance, to understand. Knowledge in and of itself without understanding is a waste. Because until you understand it, you'll never apply it. And we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not to become puffed up in our own minds like the world does. Because at, too many times that knowledge becomes a source of power and envy. And that's what we become concerned about and not helping others. Not drawing near to our Lord. As Christian charity or love is much more important than worldly knowledge and provision and the byproduct of God's knowledge. But then we see as well that the fear of God brings blessings. Now, there's the good one. Everybody's going, oh, yeah, I like that part. We're told in the New Testament that we're not promised material blessings like they were in the Old Testament. They're guaranteed. God said, you honor me and worship me, and I will do all these things for you. You'll become powerful, and they were. The most influential nation, the richest nation in the world. Everything was good, but he said, you go against me, but then the curses. And they're worse than the blessings. I'm glad we are not under the Old Testament dispensation. Uh-oh, I'm a dispensationalist. But we are told that we will have spiritual blessings. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. It's not about what we have in this life. Matter of fact, if we get too many spirit or too many material blessings, we seem to get further from God instead of closer. But he's promised us spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We have something to look forward to. We have hope. Not only that our eternity is settled in heaven and being with Christ, but the blessings that he has for us that goes along with it. And I don't know what all that means. It's got to be good. God did it. And so we will have the fear of God brings blessings in our lives. In Psalm 112 verse 1 it says, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. Now that word blessed there means happy. You can be happy in Christ. You can smile during the church services. I know Brother Tim tried to get us to smile during a song, but that's kind of hard smiling and singing. It's kind of like doing, playing the piano for me. The left hand doesn't do, things just don't work well. But we can be happy. And we as Christians, we have everything to be happy for. Blessed, happy is the man that feareth the Lord, that diligently or that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Delight in the word of God. Some go, oh, it's a drudge. I got I to gotta do my Bible reading tonight. Oh, there's a good movie on. Delight in the, in the word of God. There is so much there for us. Not just for knowledge. But did you ever notice when you did read it, don't you feel a little closer to God? Delight in it. Delight in his commandments. Fear and delighting in God's work go together. If you truly fear the Lord, you'll love his word. I remember, and this is before I got saved, that a young woman that gave me a Bible to read, and I mocked her for it. I said, you know, don't, don't waste your time. I tried that once years ago, and I couldn't get through the first sentence of the first book. And... Uh, and she goes, well, you know, do with it what you want. And to me, I made the mistake then as a lost person and then found out that it was the best thing that ever happened. I opened it up and I started reading and I got past the first sentence and the second and the third and the chapter and the next chapter. And I didn't put that book down except to eat and work until I finished it. I was delighting in the word, and I didn't understand half of what I was reading. We can delight in the word of God because it is God. 
And we say we love God, but yet don't want to talk to him, don't want to learn of him, don't want to know him, and wonder why we struggle. The fear of God is in the blessings of God that we love him and delight in him and his word. Psalm 115 verse 13, he says, He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. And that word bless there means to praise, to adore. And I was was looking that up, and I'm I'm not a, a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar by any stretch of the imagination, so I go to the the concordances and things and study, and I look at it and I go, man, I wish the English language could, could grasp some of the things that, that we can get from these other languages. But not only to praise him, which I know we should do, but I love the idea of adoring him. Do you adore Jesus? I know us guys sometimes want to use those. Oh, that's, a, that's a girly kind of word. I adore him. And you know what's wonderful? He adores me. He adores you. You are precious in his sight. You are special. We are a pearl of great price, the Bible tells us. So much so that the merchant Christ, he came and paid that great price of redemption for us. Because we're precious. He adores us. All that love him and fear him will be blessed no matter what position you may hold in this world. Whether you're the least of the men of women or the greatest. God is not a respecter of persons, it tells us in Romans 2.11. Material wealth is not a good gauge of God's blessing and love. If you think because you have been blessed with material blessings, I have. There, I, there's nothing I have want of. Now, my wants have changed since I have known the Lord, and that's probably part of it. But if you think that, oh, well, God's blessing me, so that means we're right, we're good. Not necessarily. A lot of the best Christians in the world that love the Lord have the least, struggle the most. But we know that we have future blessings coming. If we fear the Lord. The fear of God brings hatred of sin. And warning to fear its consequences. In Hebrews 10.31 it says, It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. There's where the terror comes in. Be afraid. God doesn't mess around. He came in love to save us. But judgment is coming, and there will be no pity. None. Well, he's a loving God. He wouldn't do that. Yeah, he came in love. He gave himself in love. He paid our wages of sin, which is death. And if we reject his free gift of salvation, judgments are coming. And it's not going to be good. In Proverbs 8.13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil pride and arrogancy hate evil love what God loves and hate what God hates the times that we may find ourselves sinning in our thoughts saying something unkind that we know we shouldn't have said as soon as the words come out of our mouths we're to be going oh you bum why did I say that why did I think it why did I dwell on it God hates that doesn't hate me. He hates that sin. I need to hate it. Because until we hate it, we'll continue to emulate it or to do it again. We're to turn away from sin, not be who we once were, be new in the Lord. In Christ, we're no longer under the dominion of sin and evil and wickedness. It should be revolting to us. Talks about that in Romans 6.14. We don't have to be sinners. We are. We have that old nature. Paul struggled with it in Romans chapter 7. But we're not under the dominion of it. It doesn't control us anymore. Unless we want to give in to it. That's why staying in the word is important. It keeps us out of sin. As we hate sin, it will close the door to worldliness and the affections of this world. When our affections are to be on things above, you know, if you keep your eyes on things above, there's no place for the things of the world. 
Well, then also the fear of God brings long life. Proverb 10.27 says, The fear of God prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Well, you might think in a worldly sense in that, well, uh, this means you can live to 120 or something like that. I don't believe it's talking about uh, the number of years in this world. But if you love God, you're going to live forever. Not in this old body. Oh, am I so thankful for that. But in a new body with no sin any longer and will live forever. But yet the world, those who reject the free gift of God, their life will be shortened. They don't have that same eternity to look forward to. They have eternal death where we have eternal life. In the Old Testament, we could see the prolonging of days, but in the New Testament, we're assured of eternal life where the wicked is promised eternal death and separation. Proverbs 14, 27 says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to, be, to depart from the snares of death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life. I like that word. You can't lose it. You can't shake it. You can't get rid of it. If you're truly born again today, you're stuck with God forever. I mean, that's a good thing. I've made it sound like a bad thing. He won't get rid of us. We won't get rid of him. How wonderful. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life in Proverbs 19, 23. And he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. We can be contented and satisfied in this life with a proper fear of God guiding us in all that we do. Fear in the Lord will lead us to trusting in the Lord. And when we trust him, he will be a help and a comfort to us. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. What a great promise. He will defend us and he will protect us when we fear him. The fear of God can bring, and I used this word just a moment ago, contentment. How many of us want to feel content? I think I'll put my hand up for you. There's just times I've, I don't feel very contented, and I can be. When we fear the Lord, it brings contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. It tells us in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 6. It can bring an unwavering, uh, unwavering satisfaction. We see in Psalm 34, 9, it says, O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. When Jesus is enough, there is no place, no need for anything else because he's enough. He fills that desire. He fills those hopes, dreams, everything that we care for in this life. He fills those places. Before I got saved, and I know I've repeated my testimony to many over the years, but it's because I was searching. And I wasn't searching for God, but I was searching because I had this hole that seemed so big. And I tried to fill it with drugs and alcohol and motorcycles and cameras and skis and mountain climbing. And I mean, I could go down the list. I've, you name it, I've probably tried it or done it, trying to fill that hole. And when I read the Bible that time, I found out that Jesus would fill that hole, and he did. And not that many of those things were bad or wrong, but they would never fill the hole. Jesus is enough. We can do those things. I can do them, but there, I have no place for those things anymore. I got time for that stuff. I want to spend time in the word. I want to preach. I want to sing praises to him. I want to fellowship with his people. That's what fills me now. My desires and wants and hopes and dreams are filled in him. He's enough. And because of that, I'm content. 
there isn't anything I want in this life. God has already given me more than I deserve. And I think if you think about it yourself, he has for you as well. When we fear God, when we reverence him, when we love him, it'll bring contentment in what we have, in where we are, our station in life, where we're living. Believe me, when God moved me to Nebraska, I thought, Lord, anywhere but Nebraska. But it was some of the best years of my life. And then what was bad enough, I wouldn't even drive down to Denver, let alone live here. And God called me to Denver. This has been the best 12 years of my life. I have no desire to leave this place. I'm content being here. Wyoming may be home to some respect, but this is my home. You are my family. This is where my wife is at. I have no need to go anywhere, to be anyone other than who I am, getting to do what I get to do. I'm contented. But like Paul, we must learn to be content. You have to accept some things. you got to learn it. The contentment is in everything. If you allow yourself to be content with it. The minute we want more, something else, you're not going to be content. And fear of God will bring contentment. To fear God means that we need to teach our children to fear the Lord. I'm afraid there's not enough of that. There was a movie out, and I'm trying, there's so many of them out, a good Christian movie, and I can't remember which one it was now, but he wanted, I think it was Courageous. And he wanted to change his life. He had lost his young daughter. And uh, it convinced him that he needed to teach his children, teach his son who he had left to love God. And they went out for a run, something that he didn't enjoy doing, but he learned to enjoy doing because it pleased his son. And they went out for a run and he, he said, well, let's stop for a minute. And he said, I want you to love God, to know him and love him. And his son said, yes, dad. Because he saw that his father loved God and he trusted him. We all have that responsibility to our children, our grandchildren, to people around us to teach them of the Lord and how much we love him. My greatest thing I want to get to you is how much I love my Savior. And people need to see that in your life. And they'll change because they'll want what you have. But we need to teach our children. We need to teach others. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, it says that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life. Just because our children grow up doesn't mean we're not teaching them. And we need to teach them that we love God, that he is enough, that he's more than enough. And that thy days may be prolonged. Teach your children. Teach your neighbors. Teach people you don't know. By how you love God. As we teach them. They learn that the fear of God will bring guidance. To them and to us. In Psalm 25 verse 12 through 14 it says. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. If a person fear the Lord, he will teach them and guide them into all truth. To direct our paths. What proverb talks about that? Proverb 3, verse 5 and 6. Acknowledge him in all his ways and he will direct thy paths. He will guide us. He will guide them. When going through the hard parts of teenage life and young adults and difficult times, if we fear him, he will guide us through his word through his Holy Spirit. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility in Proverbs 15.33. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to go through a few more. I have a second part. This was actually one message that I had to split into two, which I probably need to split into three. And it's because of that same thing that I'm talking about, that 
God requires of us to fear him. And when you fear him, he does so much for us. We have so much from him and for him and to him. And so I'm going to quickly finish this up. But we need to, or we need to fear God because it's our duty. If you can't do it for any other reason, it's our duty to fear him. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. It tells us in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. This is the whole duty of man. We're too busy fearing other things, doing other things, concerning ourselves with other things. Let's fear God. That's our duty. Obey him no matter how hard or how easy. Whether it makes sense or not, it doesn't matter. It didn't make sense for me to go to Nebraska, especially that you should have seen that church building that the Lord wanted me to take. And then he moved me down here. It didn't make sense. Why? I'm a little town preacher. I'm a country preacher. I'm a bumpkin. I'm not some great orator or anything. Why does he send me down here? It doesn't make sense. But I'm so thankful I'm here. It's our duty. As we love God and fear Him, we are compelled to do our duty. I think of the movie in Gods and Generals. It was often repeated to the men as they had difficult tasks to perform. They kept saying, do your duty. Up. Do your duty. Christian, up. Do your duty. Fear God. Love Him. Serve Him. Worship Him. Honor Him. And when we do that, he has so much for us that this world will lose its pull and its influence on us. Fear God and honor him, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. God will also honor those that love and fear him. God will honor us. Why do you think about that? That's pretty amazing. That God will honor us when we love and fear him. And when we love him, we can have a strong confidence. And the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have place of refuge. If you need confidence, it's not in yourselves, it's not in your education, it's not in having a fast car or a lot of money or a certain job. Confidence is in the Lord. David was encouraged. He encouraged himself in the Lord. We need confidence in the Lord. And when we fear him, we will love and trust him and have full assurance and therefore be confident of all that he promises us. And the fear of the Lord quickly should make him our treasure. In Isaiah 33, 6, it says, Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Oh, is he not your treasure today? We treasure many things. I used to treasure all kinds of stuff. My gun vault is now empty. Yeah, not quite. But they're no longer my treasure. But there was a time. And my Harley Davidson was my treasure. We needed windows for a house and the salesman come by, you guys need new windows. And I go, well, yeah, but I got Chrome to pay for. It's because the things of the world were my treasure and now the Lord is my treasure. He's done a work in my heart. I fear him and I honor him and I reverence him and he's my treasure. He's what is most important to me. Now there are times... I put him on the shelf like anybody else. Or he comes in second. So I am no different or better than anyone. But when we fear him, like all Christians should, not only is our duty, but because we make him our treasure. As he sees us as precious to him, he becomes precious to us. We are to treasure our prized possessions in this life. Why should we not? treasure our precious possession of our Lord and and Savior Jesus Christ. God doesn't give us the spirit of fear, 
but of love and power and a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1.7. Yet we are to fear and honor and reverence the Lord. And when we do that, God will pour his grace upon us in ways that we've never imagined. And I finish then with this question, do you fear the Lord? Or do you only believe in him? God requires us to fear him. Let's close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, again, we thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, you are so good to us. And yet, so many times we don't fear you. The lost, they don't care about you and don't want to know you. But, Father, for us as Christians today, you require us to fear you. But not for your benefit as much as our benefit. And so, Father, help us today through your word that your Holy Spirit would minister to our hearts. It might remind us that we fear the world, but we don't fear you. Help us to do our duty for our benefit, for our relationship with you, for the benefit of everyone around us. So, Father, I pray now during this invitation time that you would speak to the hearts of your people. But if there is one here today that does not know Jesus Christ, he doesn't know you, that this would be his day of salvation. They would come forward during this invitation time and bow a knee and we can show him how to be saved, how to know you, how to fear you. That this Lord's day would become a day of true reverence and worship and no longer just something to be accomplished. Father, speak to the people here today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed, no looking around. This is your opportunity to respond to the message. There at your seat here by the pulpit, this invitation time is yours.
all God's people said, amen. There is still room at the cross. That is one place that's never going to fill up. Great song. And thank you so much for putting up with me today. And thank you for being with us. Uh, we will have services tonight. And so please, uh, please come by. Come as often as you can. And yeah, coming virtually is acceptable. Uh, come in person because I need you. And actually, you need one another.